Uh, good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. I'm Sukhendra Das, uh, speaking on behalf of Centre for Research in Post Humanities, Bakura University. It's my pleasure and an honor uh, to introduce our speaker, Dr. James Martel. Dr. Martel is an associate professor of Romance Languages at Lyon Colleges, USA. He has done his PhD from the University of Notre Dame. He co-edited Samuel Beckett and the Encounter of Philosophy and Literature with Orko Chattopadhyay in 2013. He also co-edited with Fernanda Nequet in 2018 a special volume called Samuel Beckett Today titled Beckett Beyond Words and in 2021 the book titled Bodies Theorizing Body Inscription Across Disciplines and Cultures with Eric Larson. Uh, his book, uh, Modernism, Self Creation and the Maternal, the Mother Son, was published in 2019. Uh, he is currently editing a book on the Marquis de Sade and Modernism. He is also working on a short book on Pickett and Derrida for Cambridge Elements and on a monograph on surfaces of thought in European literature and philosophy. I welcome Dr. Martel. Uh, now I would request our Honorable Registrar, Dr. Shorab Dotto, to share his thoughts with us. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sukhendu Das, my brilliant colleague of Bakura University, for this uh, nice introduction on our honorable speaker for today, James Martel. Uh, let me, uh, on behalf of the entire Bakura University family, uh, wholeheartedly welcome uh, all present here in this uh, August gathering in a virtual platform for this excellent event of International Web Lecture Series under the umbrella of the Center for Research in Post-Humanities, Bakura University. I especially thank Associate Professor of uh, Romance Languages of the prestigious Leon College, James Martel, sir, you are especially, wholeheartedly welcome to Bakura University. Being the registrar of this unit, this is my duty to welcome you in this August gathering, and I wholeheartedly express my gratefulness that you have accepted our invitation to deliver your very, very valuable speech in this series of international web lectures. I came to know that in the session of July to December of this year, 2023, there is going to be, or there already have been altogether few lectures under this web lecture series. If I am not wrong, there is a group of around eight eminent speakers of international exposure. You are one of them. So all are very eagerly waiting to listen to you, your very valuable speech. To speak a bit about Bakura University, let me honestly tell you that in the state of West Bengal, in our loving, loving country, India, Bakura University is one of the around 30-35 state-aided universities. And this university was established only around eight, nine years ago. And we are offering post-graduation courses. The 
PhD is being offered in different domains. Apart from the curricular studies, the existence of a few centers, including the Center for Research in Post Humanities, definitely motivate our teachers, our scholars, our students to enrich themselves by being present in some August gatherings for delivering his lecture on Beckett and the post-human. As I told, I don't know whether you could hear me or not. I'm repeating that in the session of July to December 2023, around eight eminent speakers of international exposure, including you, have delivered or are going to deliver different web lectures. So that is the beauty of such an international web lecture series. I do believe that with this type of web lecture, the audience will largely be benefited. As I told, I'm repeating, probably you couldn't hear me at that time, that Bakura University is a small family of eminent assistant professors, associate professors and professors and some of officials like me and many others and our brilliant city in this age of only eight to nine years have got its own reputation. I will not tell much because all of us are eagerly waiting to listen to James Martel for his excellent speech. I hope this program would be a grand success. I congratulate my colleague, my loving colleague, Shukhendu Dash, and also the another joint coordinator, Dr. Subhuti Pal, for arranging this great event. I wish very best for the event. And once again, I express my wholehearted gratitude to James Martel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Registrar, sir, for your kind words. And we are always thankful to you for your uh, generous support and um, advice. Uh, thank you, sir, once again. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Martin uh, will be uh, speaking on the issue of the sovereigns and own stature, post human, post sovereign relations in Samuel Pickett's own. And I now hand over this interruption platform to Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin, I welcome you to this platform and we are uh, eagerly waiting for your talk. Dr. Martin, the inter platform hey. is all you see. Thank you. Thank you, Sukendu. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm very happy. I'm very uh, honored to be here. Uh, thank you. For, I'm, I'm just uh, really Happy that I'm part of this um, uh, the seminar on, on the post-human, and I have so great, so many great colleagues here uh, sharing uh, before, uh, as the Dr. Ruta mentioned, and then uh, for uh, in the next couple of months uh, there will be other ones, right? Uh, I do have some slides that I want to share. Uh, so can I cannot share them? Uh, could you share? Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Okay, so if everybody can hear me, I'm gonna begin. Uh, we have that slide for the moment, and then I'll, you, I'll just tell you, we'll just tell you guys to go to the next slide. Uh, so thank you again uh, for uh, to everyone for being here. Uh, I'll begin with a direct, if chiasmatic question. The question is: Is the human always a sovereign, and or the sovereign always a human? If this double question is answered in the affirmative. It will mean that our post-human future must necessarily be a post-sovereign epoch as well. Such a question seems intensely re relevant these days, not only because of the openings that post-human theories give us, give us, but also because as these openings take place in either environmental or queer or literary studies, in philosophy and so on, as these openings take place, it seems that the apparently most sovereign of humans these days are becoming more and more violent in the defense of their purported sovereignty. Next slide, please. Um, as we know, 
and writers like Dussard and Beckett have shown us, these despotic, uh, despotic sovereignties uh, see themselves engaged in an agon against femininity and perversion, where masculinity and fortitude are the frontiers and defenses of a totalized, aka sovereign, identity. So if, as I will try to show today, Beckett and Derrida question and undermine such sovereigns and sovereignties, they do so by exploring the possibility that the human is nothing more and nothing better than an old stancher, that is to say, a post-humor or pure remains. Uh, let's see, if you guys can move to the next slide, please. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so that's the sovereigns I'm talking about. And then uh, I have two sections in this talk. We go to the first section. So the next slide as well, please, uh, is called Tears and Trembling. Thank you. Beckett's first Polish so short story, Assumption, tells the story of a male character's sonic explosion. Well, at the beginning, the eruption is described as an aporetic possibility, quote, he could have shouted and could not, end of quote. At the end, after he meets the woman who, silently, will come into his life to help him release the explosion, it is an impersonal event described in the one before the last paragraph with a neutral, quote, then it happened, end of quote. Such a sonic event, as Beckett describes it, shakes the very house where it takes place, quote, with its prolonged triumphant vehemence, end of quote. However, before this architectural shaking due to the force of A, uh, the text insinuates, orgasmic scream takes place, and even before the apparition of hair, the woman who will, quote, loosen yet another stone in the clumsy dam set up and sustained by him, end of quote, the main character wonders if the rebellious pent-up scream within himself had ever provoked a bigger trembling, that of God or the power itself. Thus, the force and trembling are adjudicated undecidedly to both the male character, in, uh, and the male, the male character and it, the scream. Its struggle is his revolt, and both aspire futilely for divinity and or completion. What is more, they aspire not only to release their tremors, but also to make the creator or creating force tremble as well. As one would expect, especially given the remains of unanimous tendencies in Beckett, if at the end there is a fusion between the sonic explosion, called Great Storm of Sound, and the forest and the sea, such fusion can only expel the death of the character. Thus, even though through his sexual encounters with the woman he did experience every night a type of apotheosis, quote, each night he died and was God, end of quote, at the end, there was no other divine trembling besides his own. For such an early text, it is impressive how Beckett had already identified one of his main and lasting conundrums the question of an embodied yet impersonal force or necessity making him or his characters speak, yell, sing, or write a final word, or in French, quoi. This is the question and structure of one of Beckett's last texts, the poem Commandia, or where is the word, where in a classic Beckettian mixing of epistemological and ontological questions, what needs to be said, or the word one is looking for, Lingers, lingers between a general or private given of the world, donné to say, given all this, a phenomenon or the base of phenomenology as appearing, vu tout ce, ceci que de, seeing all this, this here, and a moral experience arising from a particular place, for lui que de vouloir croire, entrevoir quoi, folly for to need to seem to glimpse a faint afar away over there, what? Such a search for the undecidable, undecidably private or public word or words reveals itself as a search for a secret that, like the dear name in Ohio Impromptu, the searches between different circles and centers in what's painting, the saint moin -Fin, or the key in Il Sien Il Said, or the abyss or Abgrund in Quad 1 and 2, lies undecidably between the private or silent and the public or sayable between being a secret as an object one has and as the secret core of what the subject is. For example, 
Krabs and Beckett's darkness, what they, quote, always struggle to keep under, end of quote. Now, for Derrida, such a secret is an essential part of deconstruction. It marks the secret place of a lack of transcendence that, like the coffer and trapdoor in Il Sin Il Said, by keeping, even if empty, the space or location for such a transcendence negates pure unaffected immanence or a purely empirical world. Derrida described it in a late interview with Le Temps Moderne in terms reminiscent of the empty centers of Beckett's text, which, be them literal, like the center of Quad 1 and 2, or nominal, like Godot himself, are the thing, last shows, or what makes the characters and writers speak, and writer speak, inscribe, write, and ultimately go on. For Derrida, and I quote, in the work of deconstruction, something similar exists, a movement to enunciate, say, or write something related to a secret, but to which we do not have access, to which we will never have access. Perhaps there isn't even a secret. That's the secret. Perhaps there's nothing. No God, no religion, no unconscious, nothing. But this nothing is still something. It's still a void around which I turn. A secret void that makes me speak without knowing what it's about. X, end of quote. Such a questioning of the place of God, religion, the unconscious, and so on, appears as well in both oeuvres, not only given the obvious resonances with religious imagery and questions, but also and especially given the structural and thematic utilization of a potentially transcendent secret dimension or element that nevertheless is always suspended. In other words, in their ontologies and epistemologies, there is a transcendent, albeit not necessarily religious element that is never neither completely affirmed nor denied. As a functional element, such oozing of transcendence affects their discourses, making them continuously pause and correct themselves, following the logic of epanorthosis that Bruno Clément examines in L'Oeuvre Sans Qualité. It makes them, as Derrida said of Freud in Beyond the Pressure Principle, speculate and state continuously, as in how it is, quote, something wrong there, end of quote. In other words, it makes them limp, shiver, tremble, and stutter. As it happens with the violent shaking in assumption and the broken syntax of commandia, or what is the word, or in the myriad of skewed speech and thought patterns in Beckett's work, from what to the unnameable, this transcendent place or figure, as the place of a secret without a determinable source, not only makes the narrators speak or write, but it also makes them tremble and shake while doing it transforming any assured speech, like Loki's academic discourse, into a pathological, fragmented, hiccuped soliloquy. Because when one trembles while talking, as Derrida explains, quote, it is as if I started babbling, stammering, not being able to find or form its words, as if I stuttered, incap incapable to finish the self-positional phrase that is interrupted precisely by the trembling, end of quote. Given these trembling logos as speech, writing, and thought, such a difficulty to state an autopositional phrase reaffirming the speaker or writer affects not only the syntax and the topic of the character's discourses, but also their identities, making them question them, question them and ultimately lose any stable position and sometimes metamorphose continuously. As we know, such metamorphoses happen both within singular texts, Malone dies, the unnameable, and in a series of works, Murphy, Watt, Molloy, Malone, Dice, and Emmerwell, etc., becoming thus an essential part of the whole oeuvre. It is this shaking impossibility to calmly auto-position oneself that ultimately grounds Beckett's ethical stance of non-compromise, linking it to Derrida's ethics of self-deconstruction. As Jean-Michel Rabaté explains, quote, Beckett's strenuous efforts as a writer help us reject pseudo-values and reach a site, a linguistic and ethical position, in which one can truly think, love, live, or write, end of quote. Ultimately, this means that the position for such truths, truths or true experiences is necessarily unstable. Its stance must be a shaking, a stuttering. In other words, the Beckettian ethical and aesthetic site is a site of quakes, 
both of the earth and of the self. For both Derrida and Beckett, such a tremor of, or trembling must be fundamental in the sense that it shakes not only all the assurances of the self, but also of the ultimate foundations, reasons, or grounds, both the Grund or German, of German idealism and the Fond background death of philosophies like Deleuze does. For Derrida, without such an ultimate shaking or tremor, there is no thinking, as well as no responsibility, since such trembling is the manifestation of the lack of pre-programmed structure, in other words, of an already made or programmed decision or thought, which imply neither a real decision nor a real thought. Just as a decision should not be pre-programmed or programmed in order to be a decision, nor a thought preconceived, such trembling must happen, as with many events in Beckett's work, suddenly. Consequently, it must spell not only personal tremors, but also the shaking of the whole earth. It is thus never just an I shake or I self deconstruct, but an it shakes, it deconstructs itself. In other words, as one of Derrida's favorite Selenf verses expresses it, such a terrestrial shaking pronounces the Welt is fort, the world is gone or far, which is the opening or necessary condition of possibility for the next line of the poem, spelling the absolute responsibility toward the other. Ich muss mich tragen, I must carry you. In Derrida's own words, quote, I am not only thinking about the trembling of the ego, but also about the trembling of the ground, of the entire ground, the foundation, about the trembling of the earth as the collapsing of the ground, of the foundation, of the ground, a trembling happening all of a sudden, and there where one no longer knows what to rest upon. upon. And this is the typical archetypal, even archaeological situation of deconstruction. Deconstruction is when something deconstructs itself, ça se déconstruit. All of a sudden, there is no longer any foundation, there are no longer any guaranteed axioms, there is no longer any assured terrain. The Welt is fought. The world itself, the world as Earth, as foundational ground, is no longer assured. I think that one only ever starts thinking within this trembling. All of a sudden, nothing is assured anymore. Nothing is solid anymore. But I'll also say that this experience is always an experience of responsibility. If I took responsibility while being tranquil and did only what needed to be done, knowing that that's my duty, thus, if I took responsibility without trembling, well, this will not be or will no longer be responsibility. I will be applying a program, a technique. So there is never any true responsibility without trembling. One trembles when one makes a decision, whatever decision it may be. Sometimes it's an insignificant decision, but sometimes they, they are tragic decisions and one must tremble all of a sudden, body and ground tremble, end of quote. Perhaps there is no better exemplification of such a trembling as an opening for both ethics and aesthetics in Beckett's work than Il Sin Il Said. In the barren landscape of this text, affected by a quiet but continuous earthquake, the Derridean structure of care when the world is gone, expressed by Celan's lines quoted above, Die Welt ist fort, ich muss dich tragen, takes place with the twelve guardians and the eye watching over the old woman. What is more, such a generalized trembling is connected with a performative reflection on tears as a different use of the eyes and of vision at large. The dazed eye, cause of the ill sin, is thus seen not as a limitation of a rightful use to see the essential sense in scientific investigation, but rather as an instantiation of Derrida's hypothesis in Memoirs of the Blind, according to which, quote, deep down inside, the eye will be destined not to see, but to weep. For at the very moment they veil sight, tears will unveil what is proper to the eye. And what they cause to surge up out of forgetfulness, there where the gaze or look looks after it, keeps it in reserve, will be nothing less than aletheia, the truth of the eyes, whose ultimate destination they, will, they would thereby reveal, to have imploration rather than vision in sight, to address prayer, love, joy, or sadness rather than, look, than a look or gaze. Even before it illuminates, revelation is the moment of the tears of joy, end of quote. This is why, for Beckett's narrators, there is a confusion in their logos between their discourse and their tears. Quote, 
It's an unbroken flow of words and tears. I confuse them. Words and tears. My words are my tears, my eyes, my mouth, end of quote. In the world of Il Sinil said, such a crime is essentially connected to, if not another manifestation of, the generalized, even if imperceptible, earthquake, as well as to the figure of Christ and his sacrifice through the ichtis, the pisiform button hook hanging on the wall, indirect sign and measure of the earth's tremblings. Quote, quote from Il Sinil said, Weeping over as weeping, we'll see now the button hook larger than life. Of tarnished silver PC form, it hangs by its hook from a nail. It trembles faintly without cease. As if here without cease, the earth faintly quaked. Since when it hangs useless from the nail, trembling imperceptibly without cease. End of quote. If, as Derrida described it, in this world, the ice truth and destination is imploration and prayer, if she, if she prays, prayer il y a, says Ilsin said, it is not the religious prayer to a certain God, but rather, as Beckett expressed it in a letter to Maghribi on September 8, 1935, it is the prayer as poem, because, because, quote, in the depths where demand and supply coincide, the prayer is the God. Yes, prayer rather than poem. In order to be quite clear, because poems are prayers of Dives and Lazarus, one flesh, end of quote. If the space of this equivalence is the depths, it is because there, where the tectonic plates crash, lies the origin of all the quaking and tremors, and simultaneously of all stupidity or haunting, quote from the unnameable, a stupid obsession with depth, or in French, profondeur. At the end of Samuel Beckett, Laughing Matters, comic ti timing, when considering the overall shape of Beckett's work as that of perhaps of a strong witness of tremor, Laura Salisbury quotes one of Derrida's direct statements on Beckett, when the philosopher describes the writer as an artist who, among others, makes the limits of our language tremble. This figure of trembling or tremor was recurrent in Derrida's writing since the beginning, when he, when he examined, for example, how Hegel saw in trembling, Erziter, quote, the first and most ideal breath of the soul, selling Hastigkeit, end of quote. The tremor gained in prominence, however, at the end of Derrida's career, with his last public intervention being titled Comment ne pas trembler, or How to Avoid Trembling. As Salisbury explains, such a tremor is part of a descriptive, non-prescriptive ethos in Beckett, a strong weakness that questions knowledge. This is the reason why Beckett embraced Golang's Nessio, I don't know, instead of Descartes' Cogito, I think, both in the form of what I can ill see, and of what I can ill say. It is also why a non-epistemological epoch appears as the utmost dream in works like Ill Seen, Ill Said, an epoch that cancels the questions and the thirst for knowledge, while sporadically annoying also the impossibility not to want to know. Quote, was it ever, uh, what, was it ever over and done with questions? Or in French, il jamais un temps ou plus question de questions? Let the whole brood on sooner hatched, long before, in the egg, long before, over and done with answering, with not being able, with not being able not to want to know, with not being able, no, never, a dream, question answered. End of quote. This is a dreamt epoch that he has resigned to, as Derrida wrote, quote, wanting to have the power to see and to know, in French, vouloir avoir le pouvoir de voir, de savoir, and you can manipulate this chain in all directions, says Derrida, end of quote. If, in Beckett's words, such as Il Sinil said, the understanding and reason as the faculties of knowledge are shaking in their foundations, it is thus the imagination, or as the mis misattributed sentence by Voltaire to Malebranche called it, la folle du logis, the mad woman of the house, who reigns alone in a theory realm. This faculty, as a mad woman in the house, is directly analogized with the female protagonist of Il Sin Il Said through Beckett's translation of the original French line that he wrote, La folle du logis s'en donne à cœur chagrin, translated literally as the crazy woman of the house gets heartache from it, to, as Beckett translated rather, imagination at wit's ends spreads its sad wings. Thus, the imagination of text produced in the 1960s, like All Strange Away, an imagination that imagine, gets here embodied in a tearsome female figure coming from the Enlightenment through Voltaire or following the text from an immemorial past 
and revealing the eye's true emotive and not epistemological function. If the text is conscious of the voracious and potentially murderous drive of its gaze, quote, quick again to the brim the old nausea and shot again on her till she be whole or abort, end of quote, it also questions the possibility of another kind of perception, apprehension and self-apprehension, and consequently of another kind of necessity and of the utterable. Quote, what is it defends her, even from her own, averts the intent gaze, incriminates the, dear, the dearly one, forbids divine, divining her, what but life ending, hers, the others, but so otherwise, she needs nothing, nothing utterable, whereas the former, whereas the other, sorry, how need in the end, how, but how, how need in the end, end of quote. Such a questioning of the basic need of the self and of the other is a questioning of the basic premises of the sovereign subject, especially since, as Anna McMullen describes it, there is a progressive and, quote, pervasive rejection or parody in Beckett's work of the concept of a sovereign, human, rational subject or agent who exercises control over the external environment through technology or techne, a will to make or create, end of quote. Taking into consideration what Derrida called phallogocentrism and its logics, it is no coincidence that such a radical questioning needs to take the figure of an aging woman in Beckett, not only because of the role of Beckett's own mother in his life and writing, but also because of the two logics functioning in modernism and modern thought, according to Derrida, the logic of obsequence and the logic of pregnancy. Both logics question the autonomy of the sovereign subject, especially as a male author who wants to recreate or remake himself through his oeuvre, an act that carries with it the negation of his birth and mother. As Derrida described it, the logic of obsequence implies that the mother, like the old woman of Il Sinil said, but also of food falls, Rockabye, and the woman vanquished in The Lost Ones, will not only have preceded the author's son, but also will survive him. Such a precedence and survival is insinuated in Il Sinil said, not only by the apparent ancient traits of the female figure, but also through the intimations of her identification with a clock or time itself. In its turn, the logic of pregnancy implies that anything written or expressed by the author, by his hands or his voice, will ultimately have always been contained within his mother, who, like the original surface or space of Korra, or the primeval mod or fango, will always come both first and after him. Uh, next slide, please. We go to the next uh, section. The section is called The Sovereign's an Old Stancher, slide number four. Thank you. Um, this, this one is important because I, I want to refer to what you're seeing there uh, on the screen. There is, at the beginning of the 2000 version of Endgame, directed by Connor McPherson, a curious sight. After a medium shot where Ham yawns under the blood stained handkerchief, there is a cut to a closer shot from behind his shoulder as he takes off the handkerchief and says his first line, me, to play. Then we cut to, his uncanny, to this uncanny side of his hands as he spreads and lays the widely stained handkerchief from what seems years of use and bleeding upon his crotch saying, saying the line, old stancher, while laying carefully, almost caressingly, his hands upon the blood-stained fabric. And that's a shot that you can see on the bottom uh, right there. After this, we cut back to the shot over his shoulder as he puts on his glasses and then lifts the handkerchief in front of his face, just for a moment, in order to fold it and put it in his, in his front pocket as he coughs and begins his first monologue. While, while Claudia Olk is absolutely right in seeing in the handkerchief both, quote, a miniature version of the theatrical curtain, end of quote, as well as a reminiscence of the, quote, magic garment that Prospero takes off at the beginning of the Tempest and that he wears again at the end, end of quote. Macpherson's particular shot of Ham's crotch underscores the uncanny and bodily dimension of the sovereign that Beckett's play exposes. By putting the blood-stained handkerchief above Ham's genitalia as he delivers the line, old stancher, which gets repeated at the end of the play with Ham's last words, old stancher, you remain. This version suggests not only Ham's castration, but also that he, as the king and sovereign, is himself the old stancher. In other words, 
there is a potential identification through Beckett's common use of ellipses between him and the handkerchief, me to play the old stancher, which means that he is the one who or that which stanches or stops a flow. Thus, if, as Anna McMullen has recently shown, following Martin Harris, Endgame can be seen as a play on the Theatrum Mundi tradition, it does so not only by questioning the existence of God and his interest in humans in this closed off world, but also by examining the empty, castrated role of the sovereign in modernity, a role already analyzed by Shakespeare and other authors like Calderon de la Barca within the tradition of the Theatrum Mundi. In order to understand the role of the sovereign as an old stancher, let us briefly consider a painting realized at the moment of the ultimate crisis of sovereignty in France, right after the French Revolution of, 19, or the French Revolution of 1789. The painting being Jacques-Louis David's The Death of Marat. That's my next slide, please. Now wait until it's uh, there, so that you guys can see the painting. Thank you. To the left, on the left is the painting. As Timothy J. Clark and Eric Sandner have analyzed it, this painting embodies the unstable historical political moment when the French population did not know what to think, not only about Marat, but also about the French Revolution at large. In it, above the revolutionary's dead body, represented androg androgynously, if not hermaphroditically, with a vulva-like wound, reminiscent of medieval representations of Christ's own vagina-like cut on his side, and with a steel erect pen in his hand, ab above him there is an empty space covering almost half of the painting. If, as Santner explains, while this painting, well, sorry, if, as, if, as Sandner explains, with this painting, the, quote, task was to put forth a body that would, as it were, incarnate the now empty place of the king, the figure that had traditionally been charged with corporeally representing the subject for all other subjects of the realm, end of quote, the empty space above represents precisely the painting's failure at this task. In other words, it is the representation, quote, of nothing or nothing much, of an absence in which whatever the subject is has become present. But something more like a representation of painting, of painting as pure activity, painting as material, therefore, aimless, in the end, detached from any one representational task, bodily, end of quote. Thus, the function of this empty upper half of the painting is reminiscent of the old stancher as the empty place of the sovereign who is charged with stanching or absorbing the bleeding flow of the subjects of all the realm, what Sander calls the flesh. What is more, such an empty place of representation or empty site of transcendence, the abgrund or center we see in other Beckett, Beckett texts, appears doubled within Endgame in the picture. In, sorry, in, uh, appears double within Endgame in the picture, hanging near door, its face to wall. And that's my next slide, please, to go and see that picture. And you're going to see it there marked uh, in red. Uh, as you know, some of you might know already, when you read Endgame, uh, nobody mentions the picture. It's just at the beginning in, in the uh, directions that it's there, right? The uh, club does move it at some point to put the, the clock above. However, as Claudia Alt remarks, Perhaps this frame ultimately contains no reference, since it's facing the wall, and it is not even a picture, given that, it's, that it is, quote, turned against the wall as would be a mirror in the house of the deceased in Irish culture, end of quote. An interpretation that will make of that picture, like the old stancher that Ham, that, that Ham holds spread out before him, as he says the, word, the words old stancher, just another site of, na of narcissistic reflection for the sovereign himself. Hence, if the picture against the wall is not a painting, but like the blood-stained handkerchief, a mirror of the sovereign, it could contain all images and significantly all sovereign subjects who, as in ghosts through a screen framing the mirror for the spectators to see themselves, look into them. Furthermore, the constant possibility of an identification with the purportedly sovereign subject in Beckett's text will make of most of his oeuvre since the beginning, as Angela Morjani remarked, a performative analysis and reflection of the subject as sovereign, as well as of, as, as of the ongoing deconstruction of such an entity. As we know, such a reflection on the constitutive narcissism of the male sovereign subject in its different instantiations, king, father, author, artist, connects Beckett's and Derrida's projects 
especially since the latter defined the aporias of narcissism as, quote, the explicit theme of deconstruction, end of quote. Thus, it is not surprising that, just as Derrida's last seminar at the Ecole des Autres Études en Sciences Sociales in 2001-2003 was focused on the beast and the sovereign, Beckett's studies have, in the last decades, focused more and more on his questioning of the sovereign human, particularly with regard to the non-human animal and the non-human or post-human world. In the first volume of this last seminar by Derrida, while commenting on a chapter of Louis Mar Marin's book, Le Portrait du Roi, The Portrait of the King, focused on the project of a history of Louis XIV by his court historian Pelisson, Derrida remarks how the representation of the king's history mimics the representation of absolute knowledge in Hegel. Quote, the point is to behave as though the spectacle, as it were, when read, were taking place from the point of view of absolute knowledge, as though the reader knew in advance what was going to happen since everything is known in advance by the king, end of quote. However, what interests Derrida the most is not so much this presupposed and prepositioned sovereignty of the king guiding its and his personal program history, but rather the transfer of such narrative sovereignty onto the reader. In other words, as Derrida sees it, by projecting a book from the ending and fulfilling point of sovereignty as absolute or kingly, the writer gives the reader through this simulacrum effect, says Derrida, which is congen congenital to sovereignty, the chance to, as it were, borrow or even partake in this sovereignty, feeling those themselves as absolute, fulfilled, and untouchable as the ultimate sovereign. Quote from Derrida, by giving the reading or watching subject of the narrative representation the illusion of, pulling, of himself pulling sovereignty the strings of history, sorry, pulling so sovereignly the strings of history or the story or of the marionette, the mystification of representation is constituted by this simulacrum of a true transfer of sovereignty. The reader, the spectator of this history of the king, has the illusion of knowing everything in advance, of sharing absolute knowledge with the king, and of himself producing the story that is being recounted to him. He participates in sovereignty, a sovereignty he shares or borrows, end of quote. If such a simulacrum is an essential trait, congenital, says Derrida, of sovereignty, it is because the sovereign, in our tradition at least, is conceived, as Derrida shows, as the one who has the power to say and determine himself absolutely autar- mm. I'll repeat the last sentence. Uh, if such a simulacrum is an essential trait, congenital, says Derrida, of sovereignty, it is because the sovereign, in our tradition at least, is conceived, as Derrida shows, as the one who has the power to say and determine himself absolutely autarkic. That is to say, not only auto-regulated, but also auto-created. Commenting thus on Aristotle's definition of the best nature of the best things in his politics, Derrida says, quote, that's the ontological definition of sovereignty, namely that it's better, since we are trying to live well, Eusin, to live in autarky, i.e. having in ourselves our principle, having in ourselves our commencement and our commandment is better than the contrary, end of quote. Such autarky implies not only a remaking of oneself that cancels birth and consequently maternity and the mother, but also an ultimately absolute solitude or the solitude of the absolute ruler. Examining the etymology of absolute, Derrida exposes this essential solitude of the ultimate sovereign as its essential trait and condition of possibility. According to this logic, only an absolute sovereign can say, I am alone. And it can only say it to himself. I am alone, does moreover mean I am absolute, that is, absolve, detach, or deliver from all bond, absolutus, safe from any bond, exceptional, even sovereign. That's Derrida's words. In other words, Derrida again, the sovereign is alone sovereign, or he is not, end of quote. While all of Beckett's oeuvre, and especially Malone dies, can be seen as a reflection on solitude and aloneness, the most engaged exploration of the paradoxes of sovereignty and solitude takes place in company. As we know, in a similar way as how it is, this text explores acts of citation or dictation, whereupon the listening or repeating characters appear reflected and undecidably multiplied into a series. Beginning with a statement and a command that confuse Austin's distinction between a performative and a constative, the text starts by, as it were, opening an echo without ordinary voice, 
at the same time that it gives the reader the impossible task to contain it. Quote, a voice comes to one in the dark, imagine, end of quote. The use of the second and third persons allows the text to multiply the listening and speaking or writing instances without the need to ever stop the reflection through the, through the assumption of a responsible, in the sense of responsive, first person. Nevertheless, early on in the text, the possibility that all that is heard and said belongs to only one person is mentioned as a question and given a potential answer underscoring the doubt and embarrassment of such a sovereign monologue, of, of, of such a sovereign monologuing subject, quote from company. If he is alone on his back in the dark, why does the voice not say so? Why does it never say, for example, you saw the light on such and such a day and now you are alone on your back in the dark? Why? Perhaps for no other reason that to, than to kindle in his mind this faint uncertainty and embarrassment, end of quote. Such a possibility, embodied by the term alone, will not come back until the end of the text, when, after declaring the, quote, fable of one fabling with you in the dark, end of quote, about to end, the last two lines of the text, separated as two paragraphs, affirm the absolute aloneness of the sovereign speaker and reader, quote, and you as you always were, alone, end of quote. The affirmation of such a constative and performative statement would, as we can expect, allow the listening and simultaneously speaking subject to finally utter the impossible first person, or as the text calls it, quote, the unthinkable last of all, unnameable last person, I, end of quote. Thus, finally recognizing and taking responsibility for all statements, this voice will end up being not only the literal dictator of the whole text, but also its sovereign, since, as Derrida remarks, quote, dictatorship is always the essence of sovereignty, end of quote. In other words, by finally acknowledging the absolute solitude of its absolute as detached and unbound from anyone else's state, and thus by fulfilling the famous command of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, know thyself, the speaking listening subject would recognize itself as the master, prince, or sovereign. Quote, the master, and what is said of the master is easily transferable to the first of all, the prince, the sovereign. The master is he who is said to be and, and who can say himself to be the self-same, myself, end of quote. In company is written thus, finally, like the monarch's, mon monarchy's history of, Pelis of Pelisson, namely, with a final recognition of the sovereign subject as he who was always already at the end and at the beginning of his story, this final recognition is not only that of the fictional first person alone, I character, but also that of the reader. In other words, the text performs to, quote, this simulacrum of a true transfer of sovereignty, end of quote, between its master, dictator, and sovereign, and its reader, who cannot but identify with, a, this, with this absolute position, and thus with its absolute solitude. Yet, such an identification via transfer includes all the tremors of its process, together with all the reflections and unstoppable multiplications within the text. In other words, quote, this faint uncertainty and embarrassment, end of quote, that stops the first person, singular or plural, from recognizing his absolute solitude and thus from saying I. However, if at the end, the speaking listening voices do recognize their voice in the final adjective alone, and if the reader responds with them to such an invocation by perhaps saying to themselves, yes, it is me alone, such an act of response paradoxically makes them both, character and reader, less sovereign than it seems. This is because, if something defines the sovereign in its absolute solitude and detachment from anyone and anything else, it is precisely his absolute lack of responsibility. And we go to the next and last slide, please. Wait a second. Yeah, thank you. In other words, the sovereign is ultimately not responsible because, as absolute sovereign, it does not have to respond of anything to anyone. Quote, and that is indeed the most profound definition of absolute sovereignty, of the absolute of sovereignty, of the absoluteness that absolves it, unbinds it from all duty of reciprocity. The sovereign does not respond. He is the one who does not have to, who always has the right not to respond, in particular, not to be responsible for his acts. End of quote. If company, like how it is, endgame, and a late text like what were, examines and criticizes precisely this lack of responsibility of the sovereign, 
It is because it shows not only the paradoxes of absolute sovereignty, but also the impossibility of its complete annulment. In this way, Beckett, like Derrida, exposes how, if there is not an opposite of sovereignty, a pantheist space without distinction, there is nevertheless always, as company shows, in its dizzying multiplication of listeners' speakers, the possibility of a division, a fragmentation of the indivisibility purportedly essential to sovereignty. In other words, in works like Company, quote, the question is not that of sovereignty or non-sovereignty, but that of the modalities of transfer and division of a sovereignty said to be indivisible, said and supposed to be indivisible, but always divisible, end of quote. As we know, such a division and sharing of sovereignty explains part of the difficulty of certain of Beckett's texts, as well as their ab abysmal character. This is the division and sharing that dictates, di dictates the pseudo-sovereignty of the series Belacqua, Murphy, Watt, Mercier, Camier, Molloy, Moham, Malone, Mackman, Saposcat, Lemuel, Warm, Basil, Mahud, The Unnameable, Pim, Bam, Bem, Bim, Bomb, and so on. It is also what makes the bottom or depths of Beckett's text an abyss, as well as explains the temptation and haunting of a stupidity mentioned by The Unnameable, quote, a stupid obsession with depths, profondeur. End of quote. This haunting of the depths, the foundation, Urgrund, and the bottomless, Ungrund, Abyss, Abgrund, that we inherited from German idealism and romanticism, is also their seduction, especially when we think that, like the sovereign subject, this abyss is one and consequently absolute. However, as these Beckettian series show, the center or abyss locked, looked for by his characters and or which they continuously avoid, as in Quad, is never truly one, nor really alone. Quote from Derrida, the abyss is not the bottom, fond. the originary ground, Urgrund, of course, not the bottom is depth, Ungrund, of some hidden bottom or background, fond. The abyss, if there is an abyss, is that there is more than one ground, more than one solid, and more than one single threshold. <coughs> more than one alone, no more one alone. That's where we are. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, for this uh, exciting talk. And uh, it was a thoroughly enriching session. Now I open this session to question answers and services. Question. Um, so my question would be, um, so Samuel Beckett, I, I, I'm not the biggest like of his like history in his life, but um, he, he had depression, correct? Like he struggled really badly. Like I remember hearing something about like he had really bad problems with depression. Do you think that at all affected his work and how he like saw the world when he was creating his like works to put into the world? Thank you, Jason. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, I think, yes. I mean, I think, you know, uh, those of us who know Beckett well, we know, um, uh, especially so back at, around here, like, you know, his life was a difficult life. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a psychoanalyst and, and, or psychiatrist, so I wouldn't like um, exactly talk about like what symptoms he had, although the biographies talk about very different uh, symptoms and very different um, uh, periods that he went through, something like that, right? So I think what, what, what I find interesting though, in connection with the sovereign, right, is that if he did, and he kind of like uh, expressed like you know that state into his his plays and his and his text, right? Uh, it's about how he did it, right? And how that reflects a particular kind of depression or a particular kind of state that it's you know relevant to the culture of the time and especially of his characters. And and and, and the, the, the in that case of characters that he chooses to have as alone and as sovereigns, like Ham in Endgame, right? Uh, which makes me think, uh, reflect on, and this is why I was having those pictures of dictators like Putin and and and, and or one of the dictators like Trump and so on, like that loneliness that they have, right, in that kind of attempt of, uh, or that belief in, in in them as absolute sovereigns, right. Uh, so I think you will talk about also some of the, uh, if you will, like a depression-like uh, states that uh, 
men who believe in this kind of sovereignty, right? Like, and that's kind of need of like being close to everything, um, uh, will have, right? So, yeah, I think that that would be a good a good way of, of putting it. But thank you, I appreciate it, Jason. Hi, James. Great to hear you, and yeah, it's it's a it's a wonderful talk. That you know, I, I think I have a slightly long and complicated question. If you bear with me, uh, I mean, it's it starts with I suppose a. Uh, you know, I really like the that part about trembling because it's something that I've often been interested in, especially in Ilse and uh almost like a almost an ontological principle which makes these things stand in in between presence and absence, as it were. So trembling as a sort of modality of existence, which is neither presence nor absence, but somewhere in between. Uh, so I had two questions. One is if we could connect that affective line of inquiry that you had around trembling with the question of sovereignty. Another way of asking that question is, is there a sort of affective sovereignty in the Beckettian subject, uh, if at all? That's, that's one question. And you know, by that, I don't necessarily mean someone who is in absolute control of their affects, because we don't have that in Beckett very often. But at the same time, uh, is there some sort of an affective position in the Beckettian subject that can possibly uh, negotiate that kind of a double bind that you were talking about, the impossibility of sovereignty, but also the impossibility of complete non-sovereignty, right? Uh, so that's, that's one question. The second, I, I suppose, because I've been sort of lately thinking of the idea of obsession in Beckett as a sort of method of composition, but also as a thematic idea, uh, structural idea too, that runs across the canon. I'm just generally curious about this, while on the one hand, absolutely, Beckett has that critique of sovereignty, right? Subjective sovereignty, and especially a kind of phallic sovereignty of absolute consciousness or something like that. But on the other hand, the very method of composition and sometimes the mechanics of the text, let's say what and so on, you know, open us to a different notion of, uh, I don't know whether to call it sovereignty, which brings me to the second question, but I'm essentially thinking of whether there is a textual sovereignty in that meticulousness, in that obsessional nature of the Beckettian composition, right? And the more pointed question there would be, if we could consider, you know, uh, the function of exception, which is associated with sovereignty, right? I mean, politically speaking, the sovereign state, the whole idea of sovereignty rests in, you know, creating exceptions and the, the agency to have exception. Uh, what would be the status of exception in the Beckettian subject or the Beckettian text for that matter? I know they're not entirely within the scope of your talk, but it's, it's just these thoughts that kind of crowded in. And thank you as, as always. It was a wonderful paper. Thank you. Orko, thank you so much. Uh, those are fantastic questions. And thank you so, so much, my friend, for being here. Um, yes, like I, 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 I'll try to, those are very complex questions and, and, and I'm excited about to see where your research is going right now on Beckett in that sense. Um, I think what you make me think about, obviously when you're talking about the trembling and the, between the presence and absence, right? Like you're pointing at my whole work in, you know, putting Beckett and the Haida together, right? Like that's kind of like difference. That's kind of like the, the, uh, hovering right between the two that I think is so important for him and that I, I see in Beckett together with other scholars, right? Um, I think like what I what is very puzzling for me as I, I'm just starting to work on sovereignty for the first time, I, I, it's not a, a, an old thing, but what I find it so interesting in my obsession with etymology, and my students know that and there, some of them are here, is, you know, the idea of like sovereign as, as what is above, right? Like, as, like, as, like something that like hovers above, right? So if, and, and that's why I talk about the abyss, right? Like, so if we go down into the abyss, like of indistinction and the chaos, right? Like, which Beckett, I think, sort of, you know, we have the mud, you have um, uh, other, I was trying to find like more pictures that represented like, uh, you know, the, 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 the center in quad, right? Like this fear of like, where everything will disappear, right? Um, I think you're right. I think his attempt at, you know, and, and the joy that he gets, the results, right? That he gets with these textual machines, is because you, you create some kind of exception, if you will, right? 
uh, out of that like like tumultuousness and like you know la, the la profondeur, this this depth, right? At this uh, ungrund, urgrund, right? You get it by creating precisely these. Uh, these machines, right? Like creating these these things that are hover in a suspension of organization before it, it, they go back into the chaos, right? Like I, th I think what where is beautiful in that sense, how like the faces just you know kind of like fade in, fade out of, of that, right? Um, yeah, I I I, I, th I think that 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 that, that would be my uh, my answer. Especially, I was reading, I forgot what is the interview, but it's like one of those interviews that, that, that the people will do with him and then they will just elaborate on what he said so it's not a quote but it's like he told me this right um and he, he talks there about like and it, as you know more, more than one place he does about like that how at the end is like that giving form to the chaos right is is what like saves him so like i get to and he says like it's not like a there's no absolution there's no like re redemption it's just I get to do something, right? And maybe that's also the exception, like the, the, the kingly exception, right? I get to create something for a moment and it gives me pleasure, right? Like, like you know, we, we talk about, or, or some people talk about how much of a dictator he was when he was directing, right? Um, and, and we can see it because he, he had that, like, like this is very important. Like, it, it, it's this, this little machine animal that I want to make, right? Um, and the last thing that I would say there is that that I think and I don't know if you have watched the the, the preview, the trailer for the movie that is coming out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so so watching it, right? Like it's so full of pathos that is like, oh my god, this is like very anti Beckettian. Yet I will say, like you know, that choice that they did to have the character speaking to himself, right? Like kind of pointing towards uh, Ohio impromptu. I mean, we I think we Beckettians have to sometimes like acknowledge like there is this pathos. Right, like, and, and and sometimes it's like you know, some Beckettians might, might kill me here, but sometimes it, it can be cheesy. Like it's like let's take it, you know, let's let's, let's recognize it, and, and and I enjoy it. Like you know, that's one of the things that attracted me since the beginning. It's like he's thinking about his father and his girlfriend. That's super touching. Like, um, so I think I think yeah, I think I think that's kind of maybe um, that that's kind of like that impossibility to let go of of of, of, of sovereignty. Right? It's like well. If I let go of sovereignty, right, like completely of identity, what about my memories, right? Like that, and, and, to, and to add the last part to answer your question, right, like that hovering beyond the abyss, to me, that's crap on the, on, 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 at the pier, right? Like hovering my hand over her and we are like, like hovering. Is that kind of like status above water, right? That, you know, for us, for, for many of us, like that's why he had that revelation at the pier, in in in, in doing the hair, right? Like, so yeah, that would be my. But I would be super interested in, in listening to you and, like, especially to connect this exception to maybe the Lacanian, like Point de Capiton, like where, because I, I would say maybe for me it would be in the idioms, right? Like when he gets obsessed with like like Vero and over, right? Like these steely like plastic uh, anagrams that just make him like, you know, like. Qua, qua, like these words that make it seem like so enjoyable and yeah. But at the end, yeah, they, I mean, obviously not redemption. But thank you, that's fantastic. Thank you, thank you, Tim. So. Uh, any more question of the uh, audience? Sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, we have with us to. Uh, Eminent uh, Beckett scholar, uh, Dr. Anit Bellum, and uh, Dr. Chaktopadkai. Yes. Uh, many thanks, James, for uh, this uh, interesting talk. And I enjoyed this talk thoroughly. Uh, it is truly an enriching session. And uh, I would like to thank our patron, Professor Gautam Buddha Shural, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Bakura University, and our Honorable Guest, Registrar, Bakura University and Professor Joyantu Kumar Shah, Dean, Bakura University. And we are also thankful to our audience, especially for their kind patience and uh, commitment. Uh, with this, I uh, convey my thanks to everyone. Good night, everyone. So, Dr. Martel, uh, you have a standing invitation to visit my center. If you ever come to India, please don't forget to drop me an email. Uh, I'll be happy to host you in person. Uh, to the center, it's a very young center. Uh, thank you, uh, everything, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting your 
uh, 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 books from Cambridge Elements. Uh, their web series is very interesting. And I have already read one uh, somewhere that it's geological imagination. Uh, this is very interesting. I mean, I'm also reading your uh, article on plastic theory. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, edited by Angel Rose. Uh, thank you. Uh, good night. Thank you, Sukendo. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Orca. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great seeing you.